Hello and welcome to this intermediate level Bumblebee Conservation Trust ID course. We're going to focus on field identification of all 24 of our native British bumblebee species today. We'll start with a little bit of background information about uh, just the basics on the ecology and surveying and then we'll get properly into the actual identification and we'll go through all 24 remaining bumblebee species. So to start with, bumblebees in Britain are a lot more complex than most people give them credit for. Amongst bees in general, there are between 270 and 280 different species of bee. Depends slightly on what you call uh, in Britain, whether they're extinct or not. We have one species of honeybee, and amongst all of those, this is the one that gets all the press. All the press attention goes to the honeybee because it's got beekeepers looking after it. It's a domesticated animal by and large. And you'll hear a lot about native British bees and western honeybees and all that sort of thing, Italian bees, buckfast bees, that's all the same species, that's all Apis mellifera, the European honeybee. As the Bumblebee Conservation Trust we focus on the 24 remaining species of bumblebee. This is pretty characteristic for bumblebees, it's a big chunky species, lots of fur all over, loud buzzing noise when it flies. And it makes a nest. It's a social bumblebee species. 18 of our remaining 24 species do that. The other six are cuckoo bumblebees, which are parasitic, and I'll talk a little bit more about those later. And all of the rest, the other 250 or so species, are solitary bees. And these come in a huge range of shapes and sizes and colours and life history strategies and that sort of thing. From the ivy bee up here, the latest emerging bee in Britain through the uh, parasitic nomad species down here and in the middle here possibly my favourite bee of all this is Osmia bicolor, the two-tone mason bee which actually nests in snail shells covers them over with sticks and bits of twig and that sort of thing you can see this one is carrying a broomstick here but unfortunately we don't have enough time to go to those in any sort of detail do them any sort of justice so we're going to go straight on to bumblebees for the rest of today now Bumblebees, over the past 150 or so years, haven't done very well. The first real bumblebee bible came out in 1912, written by a guy called Sladen, and he found all sorts of stuff all over the place. Species that we now think of as vanishingly rare, he would find on a regular basis and keep them in his garden and that kind of thing. And round about the middle of the 20th century, 1960s or so, people started to realise that what they were finding when they were going out surveying for bumblebees really wasn't matching what Sladen had been finding 50 or 60 years earlier. And so in the mid-1970s, an actual distribution atlas was commissioned of the social bumblebee species, and that came out in 1980 and found that over a third of the social bumblebees that it looked at, we had 19 species of social bumblebee at that point, seven of those species, over a third, had declined by more than 70% in terms of the distribution, the area that they were found in, over that 80-year period between 1900 and 1980, which is catastrophic extinction-level population declines, it really is. And we actually lost two species to extinction during the 20th century. We lost Bombus colomanus, Colomans bumblebee, in 1941, are seen on the Berkshire Downs during World War II, and the short-haired bumblebee, which was actually still a British species when the 1980 Atlas came out, last seen at Dungeness in 1988, declared extinct in the year 2000, and it's still extinct. You know, the reintroduction project that we worked on, but unfortunately that appears to have been unsuccessful. So, of our remaining 24 bumblebee species, eight, including that reintroduced population, are listed as species of conservation concern. They're the old Biodiversity Action Plan species, which is now devolved to the different countries. But that's a third of our remaining bumblebee species, which are thought to be at risk of extinction if we aren't doing anything about them, which isn't great, obviously. Real poster child for this is the great yellow bumblebee, this guy up here. This is a really spectacular species. It's big, similar sort of size to the buff-tailed bumblebee that should be familiar. And it's bright gold and ginger yellow all over, as you can see here. It's a nice black band between the wing bases, but the rest of it is really fluffy, really bright yellow. I've seen them up on Orkney and on the Uists where they're being blown about in high winds, and it's like being pelted with tennis balls. This is 
a species that you notice if it's there. It's a really spectacular thing. And if we go back a hundred years, we look at the first half of the 20th century over here, it's around. You can see it's clearly got these hot spots up in the far north of Scotland on the Hebrides here, the Orkneys, the far north coast of Scotland. Uh, so a couple of the inner Hebs here. But it's all over the place. Wherever you are in Britain, you're pretty likely to have this thing somewhere nearby. If we fast forward to the second half of the 20th century, however, you can see it's really vanishing off the map. Bearing in mind that, obviously, in the first half we had two world wars, we had the Great Depression, people weren't spending an awful lot of time looking for bumblebees at this point, they were slightly distracted. Second half of the 20th century, over here, there is surveying for that atlas that came out in 1980, there's 20 or so years of biodiversity action plan surveying and that sort of thing. The real uh, the establishment of the National Biological Records Centre and a lot of local environmental records centre. There's a huge amount more survey effort going in in this second half of the 20th century. This is a big, really distinctive species. It's quite straightforward to see if it's around, but it really wasn't. You can see there's two Welsh records, there's nine English records in the whole of that 50 year period and most of those were in the first decade of it, because when we look at the 21st century, it's gone. It is extinct as an English species, it's extinct as a Welsh species. Even these hot spots up here, you can see it's still up there on the Uist, it's still up there on the Orkneys, north coast of Scotland, these inner hebs here, Colonse and such like. But compare that to what it used to be, you can see it's a real drop off even in those areas where it's still found. It, this thing is just not widespread. It's not a common species at all anymore. And at heart, it would like to be up around here. That's where you find it in Scandinavia. It's a semi-subarctic species, really. Britain, it could just about survive when the habitat's okay. But the habitat isn't okay across most of Britain anymore. And so this thing has retreated further and further northwards, and it's going to run out of land if it keeps trying to do that. So to try and avoid that happening to any of our remaining species and hopefully to try and uh, make life a little bit better for things like the Great Yellow, we wanted to know a little bit more about what's going on with our bumblebees. We know historically that most of the common species are everywhere. And that's great because they're too common to bother mentioning, but that makes it very difficult to actually establish levels of decline and make sure we know which species are actually those that we should be concerned about. Because if you go back a hundred years, the Great Yellow was all over the place. We do have reasonable sort of distribution records, so we know where the bees are, or at least where they were, the kind of dot maps that I've just shown you for the Great Yellow, for instance. But within that, we don't know very much at all about abundance. Abundance is a really, really useful thing to know, because there's a big difference between hundreds or thousands of an individual, of a, of a species on a site, down to tens of individuals, down to one individual. Those are all still measured as the same in a presence absence map, like those uh, great yellow ones. If we know about abundance, we can try and get ahead of it. We know whether that abundance is declining or increasing. It gives us that early warning of population level decline. If we know a population has been showing an ongoing decline in abundance, we can be pretty sure that something isn't right with that population, that we need to do something to help it. Alternatively, if it's going up, even if it's not spreading out, if the numbers are going up on a site, we can be fairly happy that something there is working. Conservation work or planting or whatever, something is to that species liking in that area, and we can duplicate what's happening there at the sites where it's not doing so well. It gives us a much finer scale, finer grain detail in what's going on with these species, than you get from just looking at distribution maps. And partly because of that, we can get results from it in a much shorter time period, rather than 30 or 40 years to get a proper di uh, distribution trend in terms of where these things are. We can get abundance trends in a much shorter time period. And so one of the first projects that we just set up when we were established in 2006 was Bee Walk, which is a standardized bumblebee monitoring project. This is designed to be a citizen science project, so volunteers across the country go out, walk a transept, a fixed route, at least once, once a month between March and October. If people want to walk it more frequently, 
that's fine, it's great, it's, it's all more data to us, but that once a month transect is the minimum, really, because below that you start missing great big chunks of the bumblebee life cycle. And it is March to October because that captures the queens coming out of hibernation at the start of the season, right the way through to those last queens going back into hibernation at the end of the year. This is a fairly typical bee walk transect. This is actually one that I used to walk over in Oxfordshire. And you can see it's about a mile long. We recommend one to two kilometres because in midsummer, when there's a lot of bees about, that will take about an hour to walk by the time you've stopped and you've checked the identification on a couple of difficult bees and that sort of thing. And the idea is that our surveyors count the bees that they see and identify them to species as far as possible. We have unknown bumblebee as a species. We far prefer that you put something down as unknown if you're not sure rather than being spuriously accurate. If you aren't sure that something is that species, don't put it down as that species. Put it down as unknown bumblebee. You can put a note in the comments field that it was one of the ginger carders or it was a cuckoo bumblebee, that's fine. But if you give us dodgy data, then we get dodgy results and we don't want that. And this is the only natural scheme for abundance of a major pollinator group. There's equivalent schemes for butterflies and moths and that sort of thing, but they don't actually do a huge amount of pollination by comparison. And so this is the only way that we have of detecting these population level declines over time. We can do it over the long term and the large scale with distribution maps, but by the time we know that something's gone, it's too late. We want that early warning of population level losses so that we know which populations we need to focus on before they're gone. It takes a huge amount of time, and effort and money and frankly luck to be able to put something back once it's gone. It takes a lot less of all of those things to try and stop something disappearing before it's too late. And so to help you with all of that, we've got a whole load of resources on the BWAP website. You'll see it called resources in the tab list. We've got these reports which showcase what we can do with the data, pull it all out. We've got a whole load of useful bits and pieces down here, guidance videos if you prefer to watch more videos so rather than reading stuff, links to useful ID resources, ones that are actually accurate because there are literally millions of misidentified bumblebee pictures on the web. We also have Helen, our surveys officer, who you can reach on this email or this uh, phone number, She's based up in Stirling, and works three days a week, so if you don't get through it first, just uh, give it a few extra days. And if you're in some of our local areas, we have Bee Walk Mentors, who are long-serving Bee Walk volunteers, who are happy to show new people the ropes, basically take them through the different processes of walking the transect, putting data into the website, and that sort of thing. And uh, Again, if you contact Helen, she can put you in contact with your local mentor, if there is one. We're hoping to put a map on the website. So, Bee Walk started in 2008. You can see we had uh, very, very, so few data that you can't actually see them on these graphs here, but they do exist. 2009, those two years were trial years, basically scoping years, making sure the system worked, that kind of thing. It opened to... BBC team members in 2010, to the general public in 2011. 2012 it rained all year, so uh, there wasn't so much there. We took it in-house in 2013, and as you can see, it, it's really gone from strength to strength. We've got massively increasing numbers of bees, records in general, and this is the current map of all the transect squares that have sent in records since 2014. So, as you can see, it's really building up to be a nice national scale survey. This is really getting to the level now where we can tell useful things from that data. And so, 2019, we had 587 transects. It's a record high. 151,000 records in Bee Walk now. Almost half a million individual bees. Those numbers will all go down slightly. 2020 won't be a great year by comparison. Because of COVID, people can't get out and walk the transects, but hopefully that should be a blip and the longer term will still be going up. We're still getting an awful lot of interest in it, even when we we're in lockdown, which is fantastic, really. And we can start to get useful data out of this, and we can start to look at things like population level trends of different bumblebee species. 
This is one particular species that I've picked out. This is the early bumblebee. And this is its population trends from year to year, basically. At the side here, the height is the mean number of bumblebees per kilometre walked in each year. So you can see that 2010, there were just over 0.5 bumblebees per kilometre. So on average, over the course of the season, walking your transect, you'd expect to see a bee every two kilometres of this particular species grey cloud around it is the standard deviation around this mean. You see it went down, didn't have a great 2012 because it was a very cold wet spring that year. 2013 it was back up to normal. 2014 it had a really good year <coughs> because it was a really nice warm spring. Then declined again, a bit of back and forth in here. Didn't like 2018 again because we had a cold wet spring. So this gives us an idea of how the bees are doing, we can see whether that trend is up or whether it's down, and so this is a species that we probably don't need to be too concerned about. It's not showing a massive increase, it's not showing a massive decrease, it's bobbing along somewhere in the middle in general, probably slightly up overall. We can also look at the phenogram, so we can look at how these bees are doing within the year, and that gives us a much better idea of how they're doing compared to weather conditions and that sort of thing. So again, this red is the average, in this case, it's the average of all the year's data between 2010 and 2018, with the grey cloud being the standard deviation around it again. So you can see it's a spring species. It starts early, it comes up, does well in May, and then in June, and then it drops off, and there's very few towards the end of the summer, which fits with what we know of its life history. And we can see that 2019, this blue line here, it was a bit of a warmer spring. It got through ahead of time, so it actually peaked in May rather than in June, and then declined after that. And this little bump here, possible second generation, we know that it does have a partial second generation sometimes, and then disappeared by the end of the year, as you might expect. So we can start to get a much better understanding of how these things are doing, both between years and within years. And so we can see, for instance, that if we wanted to conserve this species, and we need to focus on it in particular, then we would need to focus on flowers that are out between April and July. It doesn't really care what's going on in August and September, and that would be a complete contrast to a lot of our later species, so we would know where to focus our activities a little bit more. So moving on to our slightly more identification-focused aspects, bumblebees are not the only flying things around by any means. There are an awful lot of flies, wasps, other bees, that kind of thing. So the first thing to make sure is that you've got a bumblebee and not anything else. So bumblebees are always furry. You can see this has got an awful lot of hair all over it. They tend to be fairly neat as well. They are this characteristic flying barrel sort of shape. With the best will in the world, they aren't smooth and sleek and aerodynamic. They don't slip through the air with the greatest of ease. They have to power their way through, essentially. And because of that, they are generally heard before you see them. They make this loud, low-pitched buzzing noise, which is quite different from most of the other flying things, which tend to be a much higher pitch. Flies will whine as they fly by. Bumblebees have this low-pitched bomber-like drone. And females... Most of the bumblebees that you'll see will be females because all of the workers, all of the queens are female. They have pollen baskets on their hind legs. You can see this one has got a nice full pollen basket here. It's a great big blob of pollen on the hind leg. And if it's got that, you know pretty much straight away that it's either a bumblebee or a honeybee because none of the other species carry the pollen like that. It's important to mention at this point that all of these colours yellow, the black, the red here, any white that you might see, anything that's used as an ID mark like that, all of that colour is only on the hairs. It's not actually on the body of the bee. So if you were to shave a bumblebee, and please don't shave bumblebees, then it would look completely black. And as well as being quite annoyed, obviously, it would be almost completely impossible to identify in the field. You need to take it back and get it under the microscope and look at uh, some slightly smaller details. Because there aren't an awful lot of bumblebee shavers around, as far as I'm aware. But you do get some really worn individuals. This one was caught by some honeybees in a beehive. 
and so they pulled all its hairs out and this is what a bald bumblebee looks like essentially completely black all over you don't tend to find them quite this bad in the world at least not still alive but obviously <clears throat> if you look at dead specimens by the side of the road or whatever they look like that and also bumblebees have hard lives they do wear a lot of hairs off going in and out of nests in and out of flowers just flapping their wings together over the abdomen tends to create a ball patch down the middle of the back here so bumblebees particularly late in the season in late summer won't always have all of the identification marks that you're looking for a lot of those stripes will disappear or just not be there so there will be some that you can't identify late in the season that's fine and as i said before that's why we have unknown bumblebee as a category and there are a whole load of other species out there that look quite like bumblebees. Sometimes it can be straight mimicry, as with these two here. These, This one wants you to think it's a honeybee. This one really wants you to think it's a bumblebee. Because bees can sting, then it's worth your while as an undefended hoverfly looking like something which has got slightly better defences because it just makes predators think for that extra fraction of a second whether it's worth their while and that gives them that extra fraction of a second to notice the predator and to try and escape. Sometimes that similarity can be just straight convergent evolution. This tachinid fly up here flies early in the season, March, April sort of time, so it's big, fat and round and hairy for the same reason that bumblebees are. It just wants to be able to survive and fly in the British spring when it's cold, so it has to try and keep the heat in in the same way that bees do and sometimes it can be slightly more nefarious this is a bee fly down here bombilius major its larvae live in the nests of solitary bee species it's kleptoparasitic on them and so it looks like a generic bee in order to be able to sneak up close to these solitary bee nests and drop its eggs down their holes without getting intercepted by angry parent bees so all of these can fool you quite easily in some cases there are some really quite good mimics out there because those mimics can be really quite impressive sometimes over here we've got the actual bumblebee the model if you like and over here we've got the species that is mimicking it this is actually a fly and you can see once you get your eye in for it that there are differences in structure and that kind of thing but at first glance they are very very similar and if you ask a taxonomist how to split a fly from a bee, they'll quite happily tell you that, well, the bee has got two pairs of wings, four wings in total. The fly has only got two, so they're completely different. That's quite difficult to tell if it's flapping those wings two and a half thousand times a minute. So the easiest way in the field is actually to look at the head. The bumblebee head here, you can see it's got these great big long tubular antennae, which most of the mimics don't. Most of the mimics have these funny little stumpy antennae on the front, as you can see on this one here. The mouth parts, again, great long tubular mouth parts on the bee. They'll be folded up under here when they're not in use, but you'll see them sticking out like this sort of air to air refueling probe when it is uh, coming up to a flower, as this one is, or feeding. Whereas the fly has this funny little pad under here, again, most of the time. But also the eyes. Bumblebees have got decent sized eyes, they're quite visual creatures, but they're in scale with the rest of the head. You can see here that there is a lot of head which isn't made up of eye, and you can see it in the actual photo as well here. Whereas the fly, very, very visual creatures, almost the entire head is made up of eyes here, and you'll see that relatively easily in the field once you get your eye in for them, and it doesn't take very long you'll start to see there's other differences in terms of things like the shape of the abdomen here and the way they behave. But certainly when you're just getting your eye in, look at the head. That's by far the best way to actually start that process. One thing I'm not going to talk about today very much at all is size. And this is the way that bumblebees are really quite unusual. Obviously, size is normally quite an important part of identification. If you have a mystery bird on your bird feeder and it's got a two metre wingspan, you can be pretty happy straight away that it's not going to be a blue tit. Bumblebees don't really work in that way. Up here we've got a queen bumblebee. Down here we've got little worker bumblebees. 
They are her daughters, they're as closely related as you can get in bumblebee terms, but you can see they're a fraction of her size, despite the fact that they're both adults. You can see with these uh, red-tailed bumblebees here, the male much, much smaller than the queen that he's trying to mate with. They clearly think they're the same species, and indeed they are. But size, very, very different between the three castes. And that, that is because bumblebees have this social colony system. So queens get an awful lot of food as larvae, about three times as much food as your average worker, because they need to have a working reproductive system, they need to have enough fat stores to get them through the winter in hibernation. Workers and males don't need that. Males need a working reproductive system, but they don't need the fat stores, and workers don't need either. So you get a huge variation in size between individuals of the same species. There's far more variation within each species of bumblebee than there is between them. So in general, size can tell you what caste you've got, whether it's a queen or a worker, or possibly a male. It doesn't tell you very much about the species because even though there are species which tend to be bigger, things like the garden bumblebee and buff tail bumblebee tend to be quite big, and species that tend to be smaller, like um, the heath bumblebee and the early bumblebee, there's a lot of overlap between the larger individuals of the small species and the smaller individuals of the large species. So they overlap at this sort of level in the middle. So size isn't very useful as an ID character in terms of species, but it is always useful to know what cast you've got. So the common species, these are the ones that hopefully you're all relatively familiar with as you're doing the intermediate level course. These are the ones that you will see pretty much everywhere. We've got the one ginger species, we've got the two red-tailed species, and then these uh, five white tails. These are the ones that will come to you. Basically, they're the ones that you'll find in your garden. They'll be in the local parks, farms, that sort of thing. They'll be pretty much everywhere. <coughs> but we're now moving on to the slightly more difficult bumblebee groups. So dividing our bees up into these colour patterns, the ginger bees, the red-tailed bees and the white-tailed bees, these are the ones that hopefully you've seen. The five white-tailed bumblebee species that are everywhere, more or less. Two red tails, one ginger. We've also got these ten extra species. So another three ginger species, another three red tail species, another four-ish white-tailed species, and then these cuckoo bumblebees. And generally, these are the species that you have to make a trip to go and see. They are generally fairly local, either to a habitat or to places, so they tend not just to pop up in your garden, unless you're very fortunate. They tend to have to be, they tend to be things that you have to actually go and try and find, although they can be quite abundant in those areas. And these cuckoo bumblebees, they're the parasitic ones that I mentioned, that I'll go through in a little bit more detail shortly, but these are found pretty much everywhere, so wherever you find the common species that they parasitise, you will generally find these, but at a really, really low abundance. So obviously you can't have more parasites than hosts without things going seriously wrong in the ecosystem, and these don't have a worker cast either, so uh, you get very, very few compared to these common abundant species, but you will see them. So cuckoo bumblebees, they're all in the same subgenus, subgenus Citharus, the whispering bumblebees, and they tend to have a fairly dark appearance. So females of most of the species have this yellow collar band and then nothing for the rest of the bee. And that seems strangely appropriate. They're quite a sinister little group. These queens of the parasitic species, cuckoo queens, will come out about six weeks or so after the queens of their preferred host species emerge from hibernation. So you tend not to see them before Easter. You tend to get them towards the back end of April in reasonable numbers. And you'll see the queens sitting around on flowers, not doing very much, drinking a bit of nectar, waiting for a host queen, a queen of their preferred host bumblebee species, to fly by, ideally carrying pollen so it's got a nest. The cuckoo bumblebee will trail that bee back to its nest and hang around outside. Because bumblebee nests are, tend to be underground, or at least in the dark, most of that communication 
is chemical. So the cuckoo bumblebees just hang around the very outskirts of the nest, picking up the scent of the host species and the host nest. And then when the time is right, they will burst in. They will basically fight a duel to the death with that host queen, the queen who's actually built up that nest from nothing to start with. Because cuckoo bumblebees have a slightly thicker exoskeleton, slightly longer sting, they've got better armour, they've got better weaponry, they tend to win those duels. They can sting the host queen to death, either between the plates of the abdomen or around the shoulders here where the head joins the thorax. And once they've done that, once they've disposed of the host queen, then they will wander around that nest, around the brood comb. They'll eat any eggs, eat any young larvae that they can find because there would be competition for the eggs which the green cuckoo then lays. Her other adaptation is to have ovaries three times the size of a normal bumblebee, so they can lay up to about three dozen eggs in one go. So they splurge out a couple of dozen eggs, and then they're off. That's the extent of their parental care. So that nest has essentially been dead from the moment that the host queen died. Without her, there's no more eggs being laid of the host species, there's no more workers coming through, there's no more reproductives. So that nest staggers on in a zombie-like fashion. Eventually, six or eight weeks later, you get a burst of a couple of dozen new cuckoo bumblebees coming out, males and females, and that nest gradually dies off. So perhaps it's not surprising that these guys have a dark and sinister appearance. They don't have pollen baskets. You can see the hind leg here is completely hairy because they don't do any foraging for their offspring at all. They leave the workers in that host nest to do that because they just feed hungry mouths. That's what they're programmed to do. And they often have these very dark wing membranes. This one is fairly intermediate, but you can see that these are clearly brown tinged here. You'd struggle to see through them. Uh, the far end of that, the red-tailed cuckoo bumblebee, Bombus repestris, have a real smoked glass effect wings. It's almost completely black. And a lot of the cuckoo species have this notch, this sort of widow's peak in the tip of the tail. So if this were a social species, you'd expect the tail more or less to go just straight across on the uh, abdomen here. In the cuckoos, and a lot of the cuckoos either have this V-shaped notch in the top of the tail, or a fairly shallow scallop. So essentially the tail extends further down the sides of the abdomen than it does up the top and you get this imbalance here. And that's quite useful when you see them. It's quite a useful clue that what you've got is actually a cuckoo and not one of the social species. They tend to have quite sparse hairs. They're not out early in the season. They're not out too late in the season so they don't need as much protection against cold nights. And they're all short tongued species so if you can measure the tongue that's fine. You, it means that you won't see them visiting long, deep flowers, things like foxgloves or whatever. You won't ever get cuckoos visiting because they just can't reach the nectar. So I mentioned that hind leg character. This is what the social bumblebees look like. There's normally a fairly smooth area, whether it's a male or a female. The females, like this, polished to a mirror shine, long fringing hairs on either side to uh, really pack that pollen in, great big blob of pollen on the hind leg. Males of the social species don't collect pollen, they'll have some hairs down the face of the leg, but broadly speaking it's still fairly flat, it's still fairly recognisable as a pollen basket. By contrast, in the cuckoos, because they haven't needed to collect pollen for millennia, then whether it's a female or a male, they have these really quite hairy hind legs. They're much more tubular in cross-section. They aren't flattened like the social bumblebee species. And so it's quite a useful way, again, of making sure that what you've got is actually a cuckoo bumblebee and not one of the social species. These are the six cuckoo bumblebees that we have in Britain. Two are really quite straightforward. Once you know it's a cuckoo, we've only got one cuckoo that's got a red tail. We've only got one cuckoo that's got a yellow tail. It gets a little bit trickier with the white ones, but we've got two species which have got these yellow patches at the top of the tail, and two species that just have a pure white tail. So actually, once you're happy that you've got a cuckoo bumblebee, identification is, if not necessarily straightforward, it is a process of elimination, and you can work it out 
and get to at least one of two species without too much effort, though it can sometimes take a little bit more effort to get down to that one remaining species, for instance, between these two. So moving on to our species-specific ID bits, the ginger bumblebees, the uniform-tailed species, they don't have an obvious difference between the tail and the rest of the abdomen, are probably the smallest group and easiest. There are only five of them. One of them is a common species that you'll see everywhere, three scarce species, and one cuckoo. The common species is the common carder. This is a bee that I'm sure most of you are familiar with. It's basically ginger all over, mixed with some black hairs on the abdomen. You can see this black band here, more black hairs in here. And the sides of the thorax are generally this off-white. It's not quite as yellow as cream, perhaps, but you can see it's clearly white in here and not yellow. You can see it's clearly got black hairs on the abdomen here. The rest of it tends to be ginger earring towards brown. It's more on the brown side of ginger, though there is a lot of individual variation. And particularly the Scottish examples tend to be a lot brighter ginger. They're sort of leucosade coloured whereas the ones in the south tend to be a little bit browner. Workers tend to be a little bit browner than do males or queens. And sometimes life is very straightforward because the, the amount of black hair on the abdomen of something like this can't really be anything else. It can sometimes look a little bit like the tree bumblebee, but you can see the hairs here are still ginger and not white. It doesn't have the sort of Neapolitan outline of uh, a tree bumblebee with ginger, black, white. It's got a lot more mixing going on. The second ginger species, and the first of our rarer species, is the moss carder, Bombus muscorum. This is broadly similar to the common carder, but it tends to be much brighter. So you can see in pictures here, it's this much brighter ginger yellow all over tends to have this bright ginger top to the thorax. The rest of the bee tends to be this nice bright butter yellow with a little bit of extra ginger working its way down the abdomen here. In particular, it's got these butter yellow sides to the thorax. Compare that to the white of the previous species. It often does have a bit of a ginger band on here, which can cause some confusion with the brown banded carder, which I'll talk about next. This is a species which looks very, very yellow when you first see it. You can normally tell that it's something different to Pascorum. It's got a yellow little band at the back of the thorax here. The scutellum is yellow, and as are the sides of the thorax. So you get this little island of ginger brown at the top here, and the rest of the bee almost is yellow. And in particular, it doesn't have any black hairs on either the abdomen or the thorax which mark it out from the two other ginger bumblebees. This is a species which, in the south, so Wales and the south of England here, is really not doing very well. It does seem to be declining. In the north, in Scotland, and particularly in the Orkneys and the Hebrides, it's doing really well. It's one of the most um, abundant bumblebees in the far north. Generally, it seems to be a species which prefers it cold and wet. So as we have hotter, drier summers, it doesn't do very well in the south of England. It's retreating northwards in the same way that the great yellow bumblebee did. And so it's doing really quite well up in the slightly colder, wetter areas of Britain, up in Scotland here. But it is still around in the south of England, but it's very localised. By contrast, our second rare ginger is the brown banded carder, Bombus humilis. This, as you can see, is a species which is doing very well in the south of England. It doesn't actually extend into Scotland, and it is really spreading out. Over recent years, it's turned up new to Worcestershire and up the Severn Valley here. Uh, those populations are spreading out and doing really quite well, particularly since a really hot summer in 2018. Um, so certainly, if you're anywhere down here, you're far more likely to see Humilis, the brown banded carder, than you are Muscorum, the moss carder. This is, at heart, a continental species. It does really well in continental Europe. And so as the climate changes, as we get those hotter, drier summers, this one does really well in southern England and pushes north. 
Muscorum does badly and retreats to the far north. It looks pretty similar to Muscorum, so again it's much brighter ginger, much more yellow on it than Pascorum, the common carder. You can see it's got the same butter yellow sides to the thorax, butter yellow abdomen with a browny ginger band on the second abdominal section. You can see it even better on this one. So the overall appearance is very much like the Moscada. It doesn't have anywhere near as much yellow at the back of the thorax. You can see it's got little bits in here, but generally it's ginger right the way to the back. And that's quite a useful thing to just keep an eye on if you're in areas like the Somerset Levels or the Thames Estuary where you've got both species flying side by side. But the best way is that this doesn't have any black hairs on the abdomen, so you can rule out Pascorum. It does have little black hairs around the wing bases in here, and I'll go through those with some slightly better pictures in a moment. So you can appreciate, I'm sure, that in sites where you have all three species flying side by side, places like the Somerset Levels, Gwent Levels, Thames Estuary, it can be really difficult to know whether you've got is Pascorum, the common carder, Muscorum, the moss carder, or the brown banded carder, Humilis. We've got all three species here, and <laughs> you can see it's potluck, which is which, when you, particularly when you get slightly faded or worn individuals. In actual fact, this is Muscorum, this on the right here is Pascorum, and this in the middle is Humilis. So you can look for black hairs in here, you can look for uh, yellow versus ginger hairs on the back here, but generally you will need to have a closer look. And you can do them in the field with a hand lens without too much difficulty most of the time. So Pascorum, the common card, or the one that you'll get familiar with very quickly, has got black hairs on the abdomen. It always has some, it varies wildly in how many they have, and looking down on the top of it like this is a rubbish way of being able to see them. It's very, very difficult to tell with this sort of angle whether what you're actually seeing is black hairs or whether you're just seeing the black of the exoskeleton between the hairs. And if you get a side on view, as we've got here, and you're looking across the bee, you're not looking down onto the black of the exoskeleton, then you can see they, that those black hairs stand out an awful lot more clearly. So you can see the little tuft here, 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 more down here. You do just need to be aware that there are black hairs on the legs. So depending on the position of the legs, you can see hairs which can cause confusion. But generally, if you get a nice view across like this, you will see that there are those black hairs. And sometimes they make life very easy for you because it's impossible to miss them. <laughs> but uh, more generally, you're looking at this sort of level of detail. Humilis, the brown banded carder, is our next up. This doesn't have any black hairs on the abdomen. Again, you can see looking down onto the black of the exoskeleton, it's very difficult to tell that. Looking across at a pale background, as we are in these bits up here, you can see that these hairs are just yellow and ginger. They aren't black at all. So it's difficult at this sort of scale. You do need to zoom in and have a closer look as we've got here. So no black hairs on the abdomen means it's something interesting. It's either humilis or muscorum. Once you've got it to that level, you need to look at the thorax because humilis has got a scattering of black hairs around the wing bases. It's difficult at this sort of scale again, but if we zoom in, get the hand lens on it, you can see there's this scattering of black hairs in here, more down here. If it's got those, but none on the abdomen, then it's humilis. And as we saw from the mats, in the south of England and Wales, humilis is by far the more, more likely of the two, becoming increasingly more likely. If you're in the north or at a site in the south where you get all three flying side by side, then Muscorum is another strong possibility. It again has no black hairs on the abdomen, so if you can see any black in here at all, it's Pascorum. You can see again 
looking at this rim here where you're looking against the pale background. All of these hairs look to be yellow or ginger. None of them are black, so we're happy that it's one of our two rare carders. So we need to look at the thorax and where Humilis has got black hairs around the wing bases here, Muscorum doesn't. There are no black hairs around the wing bases on the thorax either. And you can see here, these are just ginger, these are yellow. There are no black hairs in there. So we'd be fairly happy straight away that this is Muscorum. It's not the easiest character. It's always difficult to prove a negative, but when you get a view like this, you can be pretty damn confident that this is going to be Muscorum particularly, as I say, when you can see that it's got this yellow scutellum at the back here, which clearly isn't ginger all the way to the back. And our last, uh, all yellow or uniform tailed bumblebee, is the great yellow, which we've talked about already. You can see that really this is very unlikely, unless you're up in the far north of Scotland, right along the coast of Caithness and Sutherland, or in the Orkneys, where it does really well or the Outer Hebrides, so a couple of bits of the Inner Hebs. If you're anywhere else, it's very, very unlikely that what you've got is a great yellow bumblebee. And this is a really distinctive species, this sort of velvety golden yellow all over, a black band between the wing bases, which is a useful thing just to check that you haven't got a faded carder of some sort. They can fade to yellow, but they'll never have this uh, band across between the wing bases here. It'll just be the same colour throughout on the top there. Basically, if you're in this habitat and you've got a big, bright yellow bumblebee with this black band, this is pretty much the only species that it can be, so it's nice and straightforward. The only real possible confusion species is the field cuckoo. This is our last bumblebee of any kind in this group. Females look like this. They have a yellow tail. They're the only bumblebee species we have that has a yellow tail band front and back of the thorax, usually a partial band on the abdomen, but uh, nothing particularly distinctive in there. And then you get this fairly bright yellow tail on the back end here, which this is curling around a little bit. The males have the same kind of pattern, so again, front and back yellow bands on the thorax, black band across between the wing bases in both sexes. And then in the male, you've got this front band on the abdomen, then a narrow black band until you get down to this big yellow tail down here. It parasitizes Pascorum, the common carder, so you can find it pretty much anywhere. It's surprising how few you find in Scotland, but uh, it does seem as if it's spreading out slightly. Pascorum certainly is, so it's likely that this species will follow it. Uh, it seems to be quite a late season cuckoo. You find it in August and September sort of time rather than uh, June and July because Pascorum is quite a late species. And you can see it's pretty widespread. If you're in England and Wales, it's pretty high chance that you can find this thing. Males in particular do seem to produce melanic individuals, these uh, much darker individuals than you'd normally see. But you can see that they often have some vestiges of the original coloration. You can see it's got a little bit of yellow here at the front of the thorax, here at the back, here in the tail. They aren't always identifiable. There are other species that produce melanic individuals, but um, looking at the general shape of it with that hairy hind leg, the big square head, the dark wings, you can be fairly happy that that's what you're going to end up with. Our second group, the red-tailed bumblebees, have six species. So we've got two common species this time, three scarce or rare species, and again, just the one cuckoo bumblebee. Our earliest emerging red-tailed bumblebee is the early bumblebee, Bombus praetorum, which we've met already looking at its uh, populations. Widespread species all over the place, but a real spring specialist, as we saw this thing will come out in March, April sort of time, ramp up populations, loads of them about in May and June, and then it will gradually disappear. You virtually don't see it after mid-July, uh, though it goes on a little bit later in the further north you get. And really pretty little species, to be honest. So queens and workers 
look like this with the yellow front band on the thorax a uh, yellow band across the middle of the abdomen you can see it's not pushed right to the front it's got a black band yellow band black and then this very small red tail you can see on the queen photo here although you can see it's a red tail it's not a particularly bright red you can compare it to my laser pointer there it looks orange and washed out worn out orange and it is only that last section or two it is noticeably small and pale but it does still have these two yellow bands workers quite often lose that yellow band so we can see in the photo here it's got some yellow in here but it's not a thick obvious yellow band in the way that the queen has so you will see these smaller darker bees in May and June in particular where it's lost that abdominal band they've got this really small washed out tail still a small fluffy bumblebee with a red tail can't really be anything else males which you can see from as early as April particularly in warm springs are really really yellow <laughs> by contrast they really make up for the uh, yellow that's missing from the workers They've got this yellow face, yellow extends over the back of the head here into this big thick yellow collar band down the sides around behind the head here. It's got this sort of great big yellow scarf around the front end of the bee. Great big thick yellow abdominal band here and again this little washed out tail at the back end. The amount of yellow can vary a little bit. You can see this photo is slightly more yellow than the diagram up here. But this basic pattern is pretty much unmistakable. It's really small, really fluffy, and everywhere in uh, May and June. Our next red tail species is the actual red tail bumblebee. Again, you can see pretty much everywhere. It's gradually moving northwards and colonising these extra bits of Scotland around here. But anywhere south of that this is going to be everywhere you're going to see a lot of it females both queens and workers are this really nice velvety jet black all over apart from this big red tail almost sort of fire engine red noticeably brighter noticeably larger than the uh, early bumblebee that we just looked at it's up to about half the abdomen can be bright red and really quite obvious tail Workers and queens are basically identical except size. Queens tend to be much bigger than the workers. They are very distinct sizes with small workers, much bigger queens, and then males somewhere intermediate. And the males of this species are again fluffier and more yellow, so like the early bumblebee. And they can be mistaken for the early bumblebee, but this thing doesn't have any yellow on the abdomen you can see it doesn't have this yellow abdominal band that Praetorum did even though it's got the same yellow face and it's much less fluffy in general it's a slightly larger male it's a lot more elongate it's a very elongate species with big parallel sided abdomen in general it's actually a lot later than the early bumblebee so the early bumblebee males you'll see in May June tailing off through July males of Lapidarius don't really get going until mid-July. You'll see loads of them in August and into September, very few of them before that point. But otherwise, very common species, standard one in gardens on lavender and that kind of thing, and one that you'll get familiar with very quickly. If you can check the corbicular hairs here, these uh, fringing hairs along the pollen basket, you'll see that they're black in this species. And that is a useful way to be able to tell them apart from the red shanked carder, our next species, in which those are orange. You can see here very, very different, very bright orange in Ridorarius here, very obviously black in Lapidarius. This is the red shanked carder. It's a much scarcer bee. You can see it's got this scattered distribution across England and across into Wales, and then this slightly odd population up in the Inner Hebrides here, which is hundreds of miles from the nearest other red shank carders it looks essentially it looks like an own brand version of the red tail bumblebee 
So it's a bit smaller, it's a little bit fluffier, it's stumpier generally. I always think of it as looking like a red-tailed bumblebee that has flown into a wall and just telescoped up, cartoon style, because it looks very blobby, very rounded by comparison. And the black isn't quite black, it tends to have a lot of brown in it, it looks sort of um, slightly chocolatey hinted. The orange is a much more orangey red rather than the bright red. It just looks slightly off. And you can see it's got these bright red hairs on the fr fringing on the pollen baskets in the queens and in the workers. That's not a useful feature in males. Don't use it for male red-tailed bumblebees because if we go back to Lapidarius, you can see that the males of Lapidarius have got red hairs around here as well. So knowing the sex of your bee is quite important. If you know you've got a male bumblebee with a red tail, because it's got the hairy hind legs and that kind of thing, can't sting you. Males of Ruderarius, but also Repestris, so the red shank carder and the red tail cuckoo, don't have yellow faces. Males of the two common red tail species, Praetorum and Lapidarius, have big bright yellow faces. Males of the rare ones, so Ruderarius and Repestris, don't. They just have black faces, as you can see here. They tend to have suggestions of yellow bands on the thorax. They're nowhere near as obvious as Lapidarius are. And again, this fairly big, washed-out, orangey-red tail. This is a species, really, of large expanses of flower-rich grassland. So you'll find it on Salisbury Plain, you'll find it um, on the commons around Malvern, for instance, uh, on these extensive flower-rich grasslands and brownfield sites in the Thames estuary, up in the Brex here. It doesn't seem to do very well in areas with mountains. It doesn't seem to be a heathy species. Uh, you can see it's not very much of it at all in Devon and Cornwall. And it doesn't like areas of large-scale agriculture. It doesn't seem to do very well with fragmented areas. So if you're somewhere nice, lots and lots of flowers rolling off in all directions, you might find this. But it is really quite scarce, although it's widespread. It's never very abundant. The bilberry bumblebee, on the other hand, is really quite a localised species to particular habitats. And you can see that its distribution matches almost exactly with the areas of upland and mountain ranges that we have in Britain. So up in the highlands of Scotland here, um, all this Lake District and Peak District down to here, up in the mountains of Wales, Exmoor, Dartmoor. This is a species which basically it likes moorland. That's almost always where you find it. There's a few scattered records down here, which are good records, and we don't know quite what's going on with them, but they don't seem to be persistent populations. Whereas if you go up in the Cairngorms or the Peak District in the right sort of places, you'll see them all over the place. And it's very fortunate if you do that, because this is a fantastic bee. This is probably my favourite bumblebee, prettiest species that we've got. Queens and workers and males, any of the casts, have this really, really huge, great big bright orangey red tail, really quite spectacular. We've got um, these sort of straw yellow bands front and back of the thorax that you can see here on the male as well. It's a really, really striking species. It's like an early bumblebee with everything turned up to 11. It's really, really striking thing when you see it. it does have this northern and western bias. Feeds mostly on bilberry, hence the name, but it will also take heather and other moorland plants essentially. It's not hugely fussy when the bilberry is not in flower. Males in particular have this yellow moustache which is sometimes present, sometimes not on uh, queens and workers. No, uh, not present quite as much but basically the key ID feature is just that you have a really bright red tail which extends up to two-thirds of the way up the abdomen. There's a little rim of black and then the rest of the tail is this intense orangey red spectacular thing also falling into this groups and by far the rarest of them is the shrill carder bombus silvarum and this is probably the single most endangered bumblebee that we have in britain narrowly edging out the great yellow 
you can see from the map here, it used to be pretty widespread across the country again, but has really, really dropped off. These aren't real records in here, so we're now down to the Thames Estuary. Uh, the Salisbury Plain population is now almost certainly extinct. It's on the Somerset levels, but it's a small population that moves around, not anywhere near the size of the population that this shows. It's on the Gwent levels, which they keep wanting to build the M4 across and destroy most of the population of this species. There's a few still hanging on at Kenfig in here. And then at Castle Martin, again, it's not doing very well, but there are still bees there. And it's a shame because, again, this is a really nice, pretty little bee. It looks almost silvery when you see it in flight. So when you get a proper view of it, you can see it's this faded sort of greeny grey yellow straw colour. Really fresh ones have almost a sort of green tinge to them and that gradually disappears as you get older individuals. Got this black band between the wing bases, yellow front and back on the thorax, this yellow uh, basically small bands throughout on the tail until you get down to this orangey red tail. Again, that can fade really quite quickly, so you get this sort of washed out overall yellow tinged with orange down towards the back end. And quite a small species. Uh, it's supposed to have this high-pitched buzz, which is why it gets the name uh, Shrill Carder from. I can't say I've ever managed to notice a difference in the field, though I do find people from time to time who swear they can tell the difference. But basically, if you can have a proper look at it at this sort of level, there's nothing else that looks like it with this yellow all over and then this orangey red tail. Plus, you would have to be in one of these five areas. It's always worth keeping an eye out for it if you're in those areas, but not really elsewhere. And our last red tail bumblebee. This is the red tail cuckoo, Bombus rupestris. This is a really big, chunky bumblebee species. Females have these really, really distinctive black wings, or sort of smoke glass look. You can see that scallop top to the tail that I talked about for the cuckoo bumblebees. Great big squared off head here. It's um, similar in size to the queens of the red tail bumblebee, so a great big chunky thing. Nothing else has got wings like this. If you see a red tail, black wings, it has to be a queen of Repestris the female. Males are a little bit trickier. So again, we've got the red tail and a black face. So we know it's something interesting. It hasn't got the yellow face, so it's not Praetorum, it's not Lapidarius. So the only real thing that you can confuse it with is the male of the red shank Carda, Bombus ridararius. But this is a much more yellow species. So we've got a much more obvious band certainly at the front of the thorax, sometimes a little one at the back as well. But then we get this double thin band on the abdomen, which Ruderaries males don't have. So we've got those. It'll also have hairy hind legs as well. You can see it doesn't have the same smoked glass wings as a female, but these two yellow bands, the hairy leg, great big squared off head, make this fairly straightforward to tell apart in the field. And the female is just massively distinctive straight away. It's got a surprisingly restricted range for something that feeds on or parasitises the uh, red-tailed bumblebee. But there is a lot of evidence that it's, it's spreading out in recent years. So uh, in particular, it's spreading north through England. It's turned up um, not quite as far as Dumfries and Galloway, but certainly up through uh, Cumbria here. There are recent records, I haven't quite made it to the map yet, around Newcastle, up here. And in fact, a few years ago, it was seen for the first time up in the Inner Hebs, quite how it got in that intervening period, no one is sure, but there may well be some to be found in here. It's well worth keeping an eye out as it continues to spread out. It's one of our few bumblebees that's really doing quite well at the moment. We'll move on now to the white-tailed bumblebees, which make up about half of the British bumblebee species. To make life slightly easier, we've divided them up into colour pattern groups based on the banding patterns. So we've got one-banded, two-banded, three-banded yellow species with a white tail. But we'll start with our straightforward one. These are the white-tailed bumblebees with a ginger thorax, and there's only one 
the tree bumblebee, Bombacipnorum, is probably the single most distinctive bumblebee species in Britain. So browny ginger thorax, black abdomen, white tail. Whether it's a male, a queen or a worker, it always has that same basic pattern. You can sometimes confuse it with the common carder, but it's got these black sides to the thorax and it always has this white tail. Common carder always has white sides to the thorax and never has a white tail, always has ginger in there, even if it's got a lot of black in the ginger hairs. So this is really, really common, particularly in suburbia and particularly in May and June. It's another spring specialist, very similar to the early bumblebee to which it's closely related and yeah Neapolitan species ginger at the front black in the middle white at the back nothing else looks like it you can see it turned up in 2001 about here just outside Southampton it's done really really well since then spreading out reached um, far tip of Devon and Cornwall in about 2008 thereabouts reached Scotland in 2013, it's now pushing north up around Inverness. Still scattered records, but it, it really seems unlikely that it's going to stop before it reaches the coast anytime soon. It turned up in Ireland fairly recently as well, from, probably from the British population. And wherever you are now, this is going to be a really common species. You will see a lot of it, particularly if you're anywhere in the vicinity of raspberries, cotoneaster, that kind of thing, as it's in flower in May and June. The only real problem with identifying this species is that it does produce melanic individuals fairly frequently. They still have this white tail, black abdomen. They've still got a reasonable amount of ginger on the thorax. You can see it's got these ginger hairs in here at the back, a bit of a hint of ginger in the front and the sides, but it's still got that same basic pattern. Um, Generally, to be honest, it hangs around with a load of bees that look like this. You can be fairly happy that that's what it is. Our second white-tailed bumblebee group are the white-tailed bumblebees with two yellow bands. This is a fairly big group. There are two common species, three scarce and three cuckoos in that group. So we'll work our way through. The most common of them is the buff-tailed bumblebee. Bombus terrestris. It's also the first to emerge in the spring. You can see it's pretty much everywhere. Even these gaps here are basically gaps in recording rather than gaps in the actual distribution of the species. It, it doesn't avoid Northampton, for instance. It's just that there weren't very many recorders in Northamptonshire historically. It's a species which is spreading out northwards. It actually made it to Orkney in about 2014. It's recently, last couple of years, turned up in the Outer Hebrides for the first time. Neither of those was particularly surprising because shortly after it arrived in Thurso, up here, it was the most abundant bee. Bumblebee, at least. It's quite a distinct, very, very big, chunky species. Very solid-looking thing. Queens do what it says on the tin. A queen buff-tailed bumblebee has a buff-coloured tail, as we can see here together with this dark yellow band at the front of the thorax, the collar band here, and this big, thick, obvious yellow band across the middle of the abdomen. So you can see the abdomen got black at the front, then yellow band, then more black, and then the tail. Workers become a lot more difficult because most of the time workers have these two yellow bands, but then they have a white tail. They sometimes show that what we call the tea stain, this very, very thin hint of yellow in between the black of the abdomen and the white of the tail. But a lot of the time they don't show that. And by far the safest plan is to lump them together as the white-tailed slash buff-tailed bumblebee aggregate. Because reliably, they just can't be told apart most of the time. Males are a bit bigger, a bit fluffier than workers and are intermediate in appearance between the workers and the queens. They tend to have a yellowy suffusion through the whole of the tail. It's not quite full-on buff, but it's clearly not white. If in doubt, it tends to get darker at the front with this sort of tea stain type appearance. But 
otherwise they look very very similar you have to check quite closely to make sure that what you've got is actually a male before you can check the various ID characters. Unlike the male white-tailed bumblebee, it never has any yellow on the face. It's a very restrained looking thing. It looks just like a worker, as I say, with a bit of yellow in the tail and no yellow on the face. By contrast, males of the actual white-tailed bumblebee have this obvious yellow moustache, but never have any yellow in the white of the tail. Which is handy because that means that the males of the white-tailed bumblebee can be reliably told apart from the buff tail, which workers can't. If you've got a worker with these two yellow bands and a white tail, your only real course of action, short of doing a DNA test, is to lump them as a buff tail slash white tail bumblebee. They just can't be reliably identified. Queens, you can tell they're a white tail because, again, they do what it says on the tin. It's got this white tail, pure white, and these two yellow bands. So it looks very similar, slightly less chunky, slightly heavy looking than the buff tail, but the same basic patterning, just with a white tail instead. The wrinkle in that is that what we used to think of as the white tail bumblebee is actually three species. So we have Bombus lacorum, but we also have Bombus cryptarum and Bombus magnus. So even if you're happy that what you've got is a white-tailed bumblebee with these two yellow bands and the white tail, that's only telling you that it is a white-tailed bumblebee complex. So this is Bombus magnus. As you can see, virtually indistinguishable from lacorum. Uh, increasingly that comes down to not reliably distinguishable without DNA. There is a lot of work ongoing into the species complex. In general, this species seems to be a little bit more of an upland specialist. It tends to have a yellow collar which comes further down below the level of the wing bases, in queens at least, but Essentially, unless you're doing DNA, then this species and this next one, Bombus cryptarum, just aren't reliably recordable. So uh, this seems to be the scarcest of the three, but we've also got these random scatterer patterns in areas which clearly aren't upland. We've got them in Norfolk here. It's not entirely clear quite what's going on. This is your classic phenotype of cryptarum with this black S-shaped band through the collar which extends a little bit below the wing bases, but not very far. But, as I say, can't reliably record them beyond white-tailed bumblebee complex without DNA analysis. This is why, for instance, this is a paper that came out of Ireland a few years ago now, looking at the morphology, so species that, from the outside, look like cryptarum. You can see this black S-band in more or less all of them, or look like Magnus with this long collar band extending below the level of the wing bases, or look like Lucorum with this short band. But as you can see, when we look at the DNA, there was a complete mismatch. So although all of these look like Cryptarum, some of them were Cryptarum, some of them weren't, these all look like Lucorum, and although some of them were, a lot of them weren't. And these all look like Magnus, but again, some of them were, a lot of them weren't. So they can't be reliably done. They should be left for DNA, just record them as white-tailed bumblebee complex. That's all we can do at the moment. An extra complicating factor, particularly if you're in upland areas, and particularly in Scotland, is the broken belted bumblebee, Bombus soroensis. This probably has the dubious honour of being the most misidentified bumblebee that we get sent into the trust, almost entirely because of its name, because it means that everyone who sees a bumblebee with a break in the band here gets sent in as a broken belted bumblebee. In practice, pretty much every bumblebee wears all the hairs out down the middle of the abdomen here by flying, by flapping its wings, by going in and out of the nest hole, that kind of stuff, and erodes the hairs out of the middle, so it looks like it's got a broken belt, 
that's not a particularly good character for this species. In females, particularly uh, queens, but also to a lesser extent workers, what you're actually looking for, in the field at least, is that the yellow extends forward onto that first abdominal section of the bee. So it often does break in the middle, or at least almost break, but those will be black hairs in amongst the yellow and not just where the yellow hairs have been worn away. And they extend forward onto that first abdominal section at the sides here. So you get this crescent shaped band, almost like two triangles tip to tip, this sort of appearance. You don't get that with slightly worn examples of buff tail bumblebee and that sort of thing, which just have this purely rectangular band, which may or may not have a break eroded in the middle of it. In general, this is a small fluffy species. It looks like a white tailed version of the early bumblebee, Vectorum. It's a very late emerging species as well, so it's quite often missed. Um, you won't actually get the queens coming out of hibernation until late May, early June, even into mid-June sometimes. So the workers in turn are much later and the males don't really come out until September, which is a shame because they're really nice. You can see here we've got this peachy suffusion to the front of the tail, very obviously yellow and fluffy all over, but quite a difficult species to confirm in the field. In males, that peachy suffusion is a really good clue. In, as I say, females, workers and queens, look for that yellow band coming forward down the sides. It's around. It is probably under-recorded in these upland areas. Uh, there seems to be a population at Dungeness. This population on Salisbury Plain is still there. And these upland areas up here, it's around. It's almost certainly under-recorded because it's difficult in the field. But just have that closer look at the uh, white-tailed bumblebees in upland areas, particularly late in the season, and just have a look for that yellow banding. The first of our three cuckoo bumblebees in this group is the forest cuckoo, Bombus sylvestris. This is mostly parasitic on the early bumblebee, but it will also attack uh, certainly the heath bumblebee and... Uh, Bilby bumblebee, possibly also Hypnorum, which is very closely related, the tree bumblebee, though there's no evidence of that in Britain yet. Females are pretty dark bees. They've got this yellow collar band behind the head and the rest of them is pretty much black until you get down to the tail, which is completely white. There's no yellow in that tail. This is the queen here. And generally a useful clue is that the abdomen curls round underneath so you can see the tip of the abdomen here is pointing vertically down it comes to this sort of reverse scorpion type appearance almost where the tail is curled round underneath in the queens in the females males are pretty straightforward because they've got this lovely two-tone tail so you can see the tail itself is white and then you get this patch of black and red right at the tip here. Nothing else has got that. Some of the other cuckoos may have the black. None of them have the red. So its other name, one of its other common names, is the four-coloured cuckoo bumblebee, because you can see it's yellow, black, white, and red. So it's got all four colours on it. It's about the only species that does that. So it's really quite distinctive as a male. Less distinctive as a female, but look for this... Uh, Upturn, or sort of reverse upturn tail tip. It's pretty much everywhere. It seems to be about the earliest of the cuckoos, as you might expect, with it feeding on uh, this early bumblebee. Usually, middle of June is when you start seeing these in big numbers, particularly sat out on thistles. You can see all of these on knapweed and thistle. Uh, quite a small, quite a fluffy species. And look for that red tail or the underturned tail tip. Our penultimate species here is the southern cuckoo, or vestal cuckoo is its other name, Bombus vestalis. It has these really bright yellow flashes on either side of the tail, these sort of saddlebags. It's not quite a band because they don't quite meet in the middle. You can see it's got this gap here or here, but 
yellow collar band, black, and then these yellow flashes either side of a white tail. This is again this sort of widow's peak that I mentioned in the cuckoo bumblebees. Obviously bright yellow here. Males will quite often have yellow in the middle here, this midriff band, which um, is usually that first abdominal section, a little bit on the back of the thorax as well. Females occasionally have it, but very rarely. And it's a big, chunky bumblebee species. It's parasitic on terrestrials, and it's pretty similar in terms of size to that one. You can see uh, it's all over England and Wales. It is actually spreading out into Scotland now. That's fairly widespread around Edinburgh as of recent years and seems to be gradually pushing north, which is what you'd expect because Terrestris is pushing north as well. So this is following. And it has noticeably dark wings. You can see here the brown wing membranes. Even when it's flying, you can see those are clearly not see-through wings there. And it's got great big square head, the hairy hind legs of a cuckoo bumblebee in general. The real confusion species is the gypsy cuckoo, or bohemian cuckoo, Bombus bohemicus. This very, very similar in basic pattern to Vestalis. Generally, it's a less bright species. It tends to have these slightly more straw-coloured bands rather than bright yellow. But as you can see from the photo, there's a lot of variation. And by the time Vestalis has faded slightly, it looks very much like this. This species is parasitic on the white-tailed bumblebees, which is why you get this northern and western distribution. It's much more a species of upland areas, though not exclusively. And because of that, again, it tends to look a little bit shaggier, so you've got longer hairs, it's not quite as neat looking. It is basically better adapted to living up mountains in cold conditions. It has a yellow midriff band much more frequently, than Vestalis does, and you get it in the females, like this one, as well as in the males. So if your bee has got great big thick yellow midriff band, you can be looking slightly more towards Bohemicus, particularly if you're in the north or the west, but it's not definitive. Unfortunately, you need to look a little bit more closely for the definitive way to split those two, and it varies depending on whether you've got a female or a male. So this is the two side by side. You can see Vestalis here, a little bit bigger, a little bit chunkier, a little bit darker, much more southerly in distribution. Bohemicus at the top here, a little bit more shaggy, a little bit smaller, a little bit more yellow, much more northern. These are mostly older records in the south. It doesn't seem to be doing particularly well in the south of England at the moment, but it's all over the place as you go further north. If you have a female, then they're not too bad to do in the field if you can get them into a pot. What you're looking for is the underside of that final section of the tail. So basically, the sting comes out here. This is right at the back of the bee. And if you've got the stalus, the southern cuckoo, it will show this really obvious pitting all over this final triangular section. So it just looks pebble dashed when you see it under the hand lens and you can do it in the field with a hand lens if this bit is pressed up against the glass. In Bohemicus, it's really, really smooth. There might be a little bit of pitting where the hairs are attached at the sides, but this central triangle here is almost completely smooth, polished to the sort of mirror shine. You can see the reflection coming off it. It is very, very different, even with a hand lens from these two species. So they're not too bad. What gets tricky is if you have a male. Now, you can do them under the microscope by checking genitalia. In the field, obviously you can't do that. And you can only really reliably do them in the field by checking this antennal character, which is really horrible. <laughs> Essentially, it's a really quite a difficult thing to do because you're looking for the relative length of the third and fifth antennal segment. So segment one sticks out of the B, segment two is a little ball joint here. So you're looking for the first and third sections in the flagellum, basically third and fifth sections overall. In Bohemicus, the northern fluffy one, that third and fifth sections are basically the same length. 
So these are arrows scaled to fit the two sections and when you stack them one on top of the other you can see they're pretty much identical, more or less. In the stalus, by contrast, then you can see this third section is much shorter than the fifth. Again, the arrows are scaled to the length of the sections and when you stack them one on top of the other, you can see that fifth section is almost twice as long, certainly noticeably longer than that third section. You can sometimes do that in the field. You can even sometimes do it from photos, but it's hugely variable on the angle at which the photos are taken. You can get a lot of foreshortening if it's pointing towards you, for example. And just if the bee is waving it all over the place, it's very difficult to get all of it in focus at the same time. So it's doable, but it's not easy, unless you've got a specimen under the microscope. Our last group, you'll be pleased to hear, are the white-tailed bumblebees with three or more yellow bands. And there aren't too many of those. We've got one cuckoo, a couple of common species, and a couple of scarcer species. So, the first one, and the commonest, is the garden bumblebee, Bombus hortorum. This again is a big, chunky species. It's a little bit more slender than the buff tail, but it's still a pretty hefty thing. It's all over the place, as you can see from here. It does really well in the north. In uh, Scotland, it's one of the more abundant species. In the south, it's around. You'll find it in decent numbers, and it's never a species that you're surprised to see but it is a lot less abundant than something like the common carder. It's got a very long tongue, it's got a very long face accordingly, and pretty standard appearance between queens, workers and males. So they've all got this yellow collar band behind the head, yellow band at the back of the thorax, and this third band on the abdomen pushed forward right onto the front of the abdomen as you can see here. So one to three yellow bands. When the bee is in flight, or it's got these wings open, it looks like a great big thick midriff band as these two bands stick together, or are shoved together. But particularly when it's at rest like this, you can see that it's got this band at the back of the thorax, which just isn't there in the two banded species. So uh, queens are Great big hefty things. Workers are pretty chunky as well as our males, but they're a bit thinner. This is, along with the common carder, one of the few species that you'll see visiting foxgloves and nasturtiums and that kind of thing, because it's got such a long tongue it can actually reach the nectar, which most of the others can't. It doesn't have any yellow in the tail at all, just snow white. But it does sometimes produce these semi-melanic individuals, so you can see it's got a lot more black hairs throughout than you would normally expect, some of them in the tail, some of them in the yellow bands. You can still see that it would have had a yellow band here, here and here, that it's got a white tail. They're just toned down, essentially. And it will still have this very long face, which is a useful thing to be able to check, because the heath bumblebee, which is our other common and widespread species, has this little round face and a short tongue. It's not quite as widespread as the garden bumblebee, but it is pretty much wherever you find acid soil areas. So Devon and Cornwall, it does really well. The uh, heathlands in Dorset, Hampshire, Surrey in here, in some of the more acidic areas in the coast, in East Anglia here and that kind of thing. And then in up into the Peak District, Lake District and up through into the highlands of Scotland. This is pretty widespread species. Because it's got a short tongue, it doesn't feed on the same flowers. So you won't see it feeding on foxgloves and nasturtium and that kind of thing. It much prefers these shorter flowers, heather in particular. And although it's got the same basic pattern as the garden bumblebee, yellow collar band at the front, yellow band at the back of the thorax, yellow band at the front of the abdomen, one, two, three and then this white tail at the back end it is a noticeably smaller species and a much much fluffier species in general it um, does overlap to a certain extent with the garden bumblebee in size but it's the biggest individuals the queens 
of the Heath Bumblebee, which are just about level with smaller examples of workers and a very different shape. They're much more bulbous, much more fluffy, rather than the very elongate garden bumblebees you can see here. If you can see the face, as with the male here, you can see it's got a really, really short, round face, a sort of Charlie Brown face, as opposed to the great long horse face of Hortorum. Males have a yellow face, yellow hairs on the face here, which the garden bumblebee never has. Garden bumblebee always has black hairs on the face, even the males, whereas male Janellus, nice obvious yellow face here. Queens and workers don't have a yellow face, they're still black, but what they do is uh, orangey pinky corbicular hairs. These fringing hairs in here are a sort of not quite nice peachy colour in Janellus. They're black in Hortorum, so we can see on Hortorum these are black hairs on the corbicular basket. Can't really see it very well, but these are a sort of orangey peachy colour in Janellus. So if you can only get a side view, photo or whatever, you can still tell the two apart without too much difficulty once you get your eye in for it. The other confusion in that group is the ruderal bumblebee or large garden bumblebee, Bombus ruderatus. This is a species which has really declined a huge amount. It uh, was quite closely related to the short-haired bumblebee, which did go extinct and really followed that pattern for quite a while. But it does seem to have responded to a lot of habitat work, particularly uh, the agri-environment scheme, bumblebee margins, pollen and nectar margins. It does seem to do quite well in those areas. So down at Dungeness in East Anglia, in the River Valley, in the Severn Valley here, you it's not common, it's not abundant, but you've got a pretty good chance of seeing it. It's very similar, particularly in the females, to the garden bumblebee itself. So yellow collar band, yellow band at the back of the thorax, yellow band at the front of the abdomen, great big long chunky face, and it can be very difficult to tell them apart. Having said that, if you're anywhere outside these core areas, you're unlikely to see the riddle or bumblebee. It does produce these melanic individuals really quite frequently, or at least semi-melanic, and they don't show a yellow tail. You can see this is a fully melanic one here where it's just completely black. This is a semi-melanic one. It's still got yellow around the shoulder here. And you can see it's got a little bit of yellow in here. And you get this fluctuation right the way from fully melanic to fully striped and everything in between. So they are a little bit complex. So telling those three three-banded white tails apart, to start with, Hortorum is everywhere. Hortorum should always be your first thought when you get something that fits those criteria. Janellus, smaller, fluffier, shaggier, pretty much widespread, though not so much in uh, the industrialised farming areas of the East Midlands and the centre here. Ruderatus, by far the rarest of the three, pretty southerly in distribution, certainly in recent years. Very big, very neat. So looking at the faces, Janellus has got this little round face. You can see it's almost the same width as it is long. So it, it is, as I say, the little round Charlie Brown face, very, very short cheeks between the top of the mandibles, base of the eyes here. You can normally tell that one apart fairly quickly based on that character. Hortorum and Ruderatus both got faces that are much longer than they are wide. You can see these great long horse faces here, great long cheeks between the top of the mandibles and the base of the eyes. So noticeably different shape to the face of Janellus in the middle here. There are various papers that have looked at the different characters splitting Hortorum and Ruderatus and found it very difficult. The one that they ended up recommending, particularly in the main paper, was the ratio of face length to face width. Hortorum has got quite a broad face, although it's quite long, and Ruderatus is a much narrower face, so it's actually more than one and a half times as long as it is wide. 
That is obviously a horrible character to have to use, particularly in the field. It's hugely variable depending on very slight changes in the angle of the face and that sort of thing. But luckily there are various other characters which are 80 or 90% reliable. Once you get a couple of those, you're, you can be fairly happy, essentially. So Hortorum tends to have these thick yellow bands tends to have a larger front band than hind band. They're much more equal in terms of width in Ruderatus. Ruderatus tends to have these equal width bands, so it's about as wide at the top here as it is at the bottom, viewed from the side. You can see in Hortorum, it's very wide at the top, much narrower at the bottom, because it's this sort of wedge shape. Whereas you've got this little scruffy bit at the back, so there's a big imbalance between the front band and the rear band in Hortorum. just isn't there in Ridderata, so roughly speaking equal in terms of front and back. Ridderata also tends to be a bit bigger, a bit neater. You can see it looks almost as if it's had a trim. The hairs are all pretty much the same length here and on the abdomen as we go round. In Hortorum, they're not shaggy they're not quite as long and scruffy as something like Janelle's but we've got tufts here gets a little bit longer at the front here it looks as if it needs a trim rather than it's just had a trim if we look at them from above then Hortorum looks generally speaking more yellow so we can see this thicker front band slightly smaller rear band whereas they're fairly equal in Ridderatus which makes it look slightly less yellow overall Ruderatus tends to have a much less yellow abdominal band. On Hortorum, you can see it's very obviously very bright yellow, extends back onto that second abdominal section, very, very thick yellow band there. Much less, generally, in Ruderatus. And as we saw before, it goes from this, this is about as yellow as they get, right the way down to completely black throughout. But generally, if it's bright yellow, big thick bands, it's far more likely to be Hortorum than it is Ruderatus over here, which has got the yellow bands, but they're much more restrained, basically. If you're lucky enough to have a male, then there is one very easy character to split the two. As long as you've got it in a pot, you can look at the face and you can ignore the length and that kind of thing. All you need to do is look at these hairs around the mandibles here. If it's got a black beard, like this one, it's Hortorum. If it's got a ginger beard, like this one over here, it's Ruderatus. Nice and easy to see if it's in a pot, but only works for males. So late season, August, September sort of time, very straightforward way to tell them apart. Doesn't work earlier in the season when you've only got females. We've also got the cuckoo in this group. This is Barbut's cuckoo, Bombus barbitellus, which is parasitic, certainly on Hortorum, probably also in Ruderatus, and has a similar basic appearance to those two species, with a yellow collar band, yellow band at the back of the thorax, yellow band at the front of the abdomen, and then a white tail. But it's still got this big square head, still got these darker wing membranes, which you can see in this one particularly. As you can see, the tail coming further up the side, so it is at the top, so you get this scalloping appearance, and tends to have these thin subbands, sort of half bands, on the sections here, which you very rarely get. You occasionally get with intermediate forms of Ruderatus, but very rarely see on those social species. And this also has a short face, so it's although it's a big chunky species, similar in size to Hortorum. It's got a face like Janellus, it's a little round face, but great big chunky squared off head, even though it's short. And this is a species which is very thinly spread. It doesn't seem to be abundant anywhere, and it's not a species that you see big numbers of in general, even where you do have big populations of the host species. That finishes our ID. That is the 24 bumblebee species that you can see in Britain. As you will probably gather, a little bit of field kit is quite useful. So nets, anything sold as a butterfly net will be fine. So Watkins and Doncaster are very good, but equally you can get them from 
NHPS or anywhere that sells decent butterfly nets. As long as it's not a shrimping net, you should be fine with that, basically. Hand lens, for those smaller characters, things like the beard character for Hortorum or Ruderatus, a hand lens is pretty much essential. 10 times hand lens is basically all you need. It's a really nice level of um, magnification versus depth of field. 20 times, you can see more, but it's very difficult to get the right bit in focus. So a 10 times is a nice halfway house there. And sample tube, just anything you can put the bees in and see through. So again, anywhere that will sell you the butterfly net will sell you sample tubes. Decent sort of size ones, an inch or so across, gives you a fighting chance of getting a bee in and doesn't constrain it too much. And these queen marker cages or queen marker pots, you'll see them called, are really quite handy. They're sold to beekeepers so that they can mark up their queen honeybees. The idea is that you have a wooden plunger here with a bit of sponge on the end, this perspex cylinder with a push fit grid over the end. So you put your bee in here, you gently push the plunger up until it's constrained against this netting at the end. And then if you're a beekeeper, you can mark your queen bee with a little blob of paint so that you can find it easily. If you're trying to identify a bumblebee, then you can just hold it so that you can see the leg hairs or the face or whatever without it desperately flapping around and moving out of the way out of your field of view. So it massively reduces the amount of time that you have to spend with it in a pot. You can just constrain it, have a look at the right bit through your hand lens, and then let it go again. They're really quite handy. So they're sold as queen marker cages. Anywhere that does um, honeybee supplies will do them, or Watkins and Doncaster. Even places like Amazon will do them nowadays. And lastly, because this is an awful lot to take in in any one go, having an ID book that you can take out into the field and compare your specimens to is really, really handy. We're in a very fortunate position in Britain that there is a surfeit of choice now of which bumblebee ID book you want to go out in the field. It's not very long ago, not many more than 10 years before you didn't really have any option. There were no field guides to bumblebees. Then in 2009, the first edition of Edwards and Jenner, the field guide to bumblebees came out. It's a really nice book and still works now on its third edition. We at the Bumblebee Conservation Trust recently produced our own version of Bumblebees, an introduction, which is based around the idea of field identification. It takes you through a whole load of photos and diagrams and similar species and important ID features to check and that sort of thing. It's basically a book form of the course that you're doing now. And uh, obviously, I thoroughly recommend that as one of the authors. If you want to drill down a little bit more deeply, and particularly if you want to key bees out and look at them under the microscope, then the Naturalist's Handbook series are really, really good. Nice, relatively straightforward, understandable keys, but a whole load of extra information in the rest of the book as well on what bees are doing, how they function, all that sort of stuff. If you want to go more broadly and look at bees in general, so not just bumblebees, but also all of the solitary bees, then Steve Folt's guide here, the field guide to the bees of Great Britain and Ireland, illustrated by Richard Lewington, is the only game in town, basically. It's the first book for 100 years to cover all of the British bee species. And the only drawback to it, really, is that uh, Steve has been very busy and found all sorts of extra species that... Uh, aren't in the book because we didn't know they were here at that point. It is, although it's a field guide, a lot of the bees, particularly the solitary bees, you can't reliably do in the field without a lot of practice. You need to get them under a microscope or at least a hand lens. And so not so much for bumblebees, but certainly for the solitary bees, you do need to take some. And I've also included this. This is my book, which is why I included it, but it's not an ID book. It is a natural history of bumblebees. It will take you through how bumblebees work, what they're doing, how they forage, how they build the nest, what goes on in the nest and all that kind of stuff. So again, as the author, I thoroughly recommend that you buy it, but um, it's not an ID book in the same way as the others. That makes us for today.
Thank you for listening and uh, enjoy.